I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about a guy who was your teammate, Jacoby Ellsbury. Now, from the outside looking in, you know, the media can't get that close. He seemed like a very nice guy who did not seem, again, correct me if I'm wrong, you were his teammate, that baseball was like breath to him. It wasn't the world to him. It was his job. Uh, I don't think there was that kind of passion. Tell me what you thought of Jacoby. You know, listen, J Jacoby, when he played, was one of the most dynamic guys in baseball. Unfortunately, when you have a speed guy, you know, he's a speed guy. He did have that one year where he hit a bunch of home runs, finished second in the MVP. When you have a speed guy and one small injury happens, then you fall apart. And I think that his frustration, the reason you didn't see the passion and you didn't see, you know, a guy that really wanted to get back on the field is that even at, at, at 80%, Jacoby Ellsbury was not a good player. That's the problem. And you know, power hitters sometimes, or even a you know a pitcher that loses a little bit on his fastball, at 70, 80 percent they can still be effective. You know, if, if if I pulled my hamstring, I could still catch the ball at first base and still hit a home run or a double in the gap, and I'd be okay. Jacoby Ellsbury, as soon as he has a little bad hip or his foot's hurting a little bit, his speed's taken away. He's not good as an outfielder because he didn't have a good arm. He doesn't hit for power. He didn't really walk that much because because teams weren't you know necessarily afraid of him you know hitting the ball deep or hitting a ball in the gap. So his game completely fell apart, and and I just think that unfortunately that type of player, as soon as he's off the field and he's not a hundred percent, is is just he doesn't have any value. And I think he saw a guy that realized he didn't have any value, and it hurt him personally. No player wants to be embarrassed out there. And I do feel bad for Jacoby Ellsbury because injuries really robbed him of a, of a solid career. Good. Good stuff, Mark. We appreciate you coming on. Always fun, guys. Thanks a lot. That's Mark Teixeira. The Mark Teixeira. I will tell you this. The only exception I ever took with Jacoby, and again, he was a nice guy, nice man. It was a wild card game. You remember this. Sure. And he didn't, he wasn't the in the lineup. He wasn't in the lineup. And he just accepted it. And I'm telling you, he was on the active roster, which means that he was healthy enough to be on the active roster, and he didn't start a game that was a must-win game. Right. To me, I'm flipping over Joe Girardi's table. I'm going into his office going, I'm playing this game. He didn't, to me, outside looking in, never had that fire. And, and, and one thing I would say... I think that every team should learn from this. If your closest competitor, your biggest rival, lets you oh, yeah. sign somebody, they know something that you don't know. And Pete Abraham of the Boston Globe laid this out. So the Yankees paid him $153 million. And I think they got like a war, I'm, I'm rounding it off, of 20 out of him. And over that time, the guy that took over for Jacoby Ellsbury in Boston was Jackie Bradley Jr., who has been paid a total of, I think, $25 million and had a higher war than Jacoby had over that time. The Red Sox knew something, and I, I mean, and then you could come right back at, well, they let them sign Johnny Damon. Johnny Damon helped them win a World right. Series. True. Wade there Box are exceptions. Back in the day. Wade Box. There are exceptions. But for the most part, if the Yankees let somebody sign with the Red Sox, like, the Yankees never let the Red Sox get Bernie Williams. George Steinbrenner stepped in right. and gave a last-minute offer. He would not let Bernie go to the Red Sox. Red Sox easily let Ellsbury go to the Yankees. Yeah.